Hello everyone, Dr. Samantha Cotrera here for the Imagining a New We video blog, a video series designed to help history teachers and other history educators teach history in ways that are more meaningful, transformative, and inclusive for their students. This is B. she's very grumpy that I've been doing so many conversations today, but uh, the conversations have been so great that she will forgive me, I'm sure, when she <laughs> hears them. So I've been doing a few of these Source Saturday series. Um, the Source Saturday series is a series where I'm talking with historians and archivists and creators about to different primary sources and like talking through them so that we can see how historians understand primary sources. And then within that series, I've been talking to people on different themes. And this particular video is really fantastic because it is one of three related to this collection, this book collection on women in World War II. And it's really exciting to be able to connect with the editor editors of the collection, but also some of the authors about ways that we can think about women's involvement in World War II as not just was it was it good for them or bad for them, but like the nuances of it. Like all of the other thematic series, this little one minute introduction is the same for all. We'll go to an introduction to the person that I'm speaking to, and then we'll go to our great video on the different sources. In this video, I'm talking with Dr. Sarah Glassford. Now, if you have been watching some of my videos through the summer, you might remember that Sarah and I talked for the Pandemic Pedagogy series in like uh, April or May. And in that conversation, she just happened to mention that this book was coming out and I was like, oh, we need to do videos for it. So this is the like the, the finishing part of that conversation, I guess, about talking about this book on World War II. But in, for our conversation today, we're gonna be talking about Sarah's chapter on women in the Red Cross and their emotional labor during the, their work in the Red Cross during World War II. Sarah Glassford, if you know her name, you probably know that she is the historian of the Canadian Red Cross. Um, she is a fantastic social historian in that way, but she also has a background in libraries and archives and is the archives at Letty Library at the University of Windsor, which is just really cool that she's bringing so much of that to our conversation. She's talking about her chapter and one of the sources from her chapter, but she's also the co-editor of this collection along with Amy Shaw. And I'm just so pleased that we get to talk about this work because she's such a fantastic scholar. So let's go over to Zoom. Sarah, I am so excited to talk with you about the chapter in this collection because if you remember when we talked in the spring, I was like, oh, we should just do a whole series on that collection. And now we are, and I'm so excited. <laughs> Me too. Um, do you want to introduce yourself for people that didn't maybe watch that first video? Although they should have because it was so, so wonderful. Go watch that one. Um, yes. So uh, my name is Sarah Glassford and I'm uh, the archivist at the University of Windsor's Letty Library Archives and Special Collections and I'm also a social historian of post-confederation Canada. And, um, and the Red Cross is a huge research interest of yours, although I feel like that even in saying that, that doesn't really, <laughs> it doesn't really like capture how much <laughs> of the Red Cross historian that you are. It's true. It's sort of my life and the Red Cross's history are weirdly entwined. Um, I didn't start out with that as a goal, but um, yeah, actually, interestingly, the group of Red Cross women that we're going to be talking about today are the reason that I went on to do any Red Cross history at all. I started as a summer student in my local Red Cross branch, which was just kind of a fluke. My grandma knew there was a job and I went and applied for it, did the summer student thing. Um, but one of the summers that I worked there, somebody either found in a filing cabinet or brought in, I can't remember which, a little envelope of very brittle yellowed um, 1940s newspaper clippings about this Red Cross Corps. And I was like, what? You know, as a history student, instantly I was like, ooh, artifacts, you know? <laughs> and uh, so if I was done my work, I would was kind of try to put these in order and and uh, and figure out what they were talking about, or, you know, what they pertain to and stuff. And, and 
in a way sort of fell in love with this group of women that they were discussing. So I ended up doing my master's major research paper about that local branch of this organization, the Red Cross Corps. Uh, and then went on and, and did a PhD and wrote the history of the Canadian Red Cross. But but I keep finding new sources related to this larger group of women in World War II. And, and so ended up writing an article for this collection about uh, World War II women in Canada and Newfoundland, um, specifically about them that sort of draws together all these little bits and pieces I found over the years. And, and so it has like a, a weird emotional resonance for me that I actually feel like I I finally got to say something meaningful about these women that have kind of been floating in my imagination for a lot of years now. Um, so it's it's a fun set of artifacts and, and, and documents to talk about and, and also it was just a fun chapter to write. That's, that's really cool. I love, you know, when I was doing my PhD and I was talking with other doctoral candidates, I was, I always said like, your PhD is your autobiography in like some ways you're always built in and the more you recognize that some the easier some of it becomes mm -hmm. and in not talking to doctoral students for you know <laughs> for the last 10 years or whatever I have missed having those conversations and so I love the fact that you were making these personal connections with mm -hmm. this particular chapter because I do think the more we allow ourselves to like name our connection to the work, the, the more interesting it becomes. I'll tell you a quick little anecdote. So my grandmother yeah. was like 14, 15, like she was too young to really do much around World War II. But before, um, like before my mother came along, who was the oldest, um, you know, my family was like, oh yeah, she used to work. She used to work for the Blue Cross. And I was like, oh, the Blue Cross. So I was imagining that she was like, like a nurse's helper. Like she was like rolling bandages during World War II. Like I was imagining she's one of the women that you're going to talk about today. Right? And someone was like, like years later, like when I was in my twenties, they're like, no, the Blue Cross. She worked in insurance. <laughs> And all the romance dissipated. <laughs> I'm like, number one, that makes so much more sense. Number two, that is not nearly as glamorous. So oh, thanks. that's funny. <laughs> Yeah, um, I am so glad that we're talking about this chapter, both for those personal connections, but because the collection mm -hmm. as a whole is so interesting because it really moves away from that binary thinking about whether or not the war was just good for women or not, but really mm -hmm. looks at the nuances of of ex experiences of women during this particular time. And one of the things I really love about your chapter is like you're naming emotional labor, you're naming that as such a key element of war work. And I just really appreciate that, that a level of, of analysis when we're talking about Canadian history, especially Canadian history related to a war because it's so mm -hmm. dominated with particular versions of what war yeah. is. Yeah, well, and, and certainly, uh, you know, as I say, I had sort of my own devious reasons for wanting to write this particular kind of chapter, um, but it, it became a theme of the entire collection. Uh, there's a lot of emotion history in, in the different chapters, um, some of them very explicitly, you know, it is a focus like in mine, but others, it, it's just in there. Uh, and so it became one of the themes that we talk about a little bit in the introduction and conclusion. And, and I think um, it does get at or, or looking at history through the lens of emotions gets at one of our, our overriding themes for the book, which is that question of, you know, how do we make sense of the difference between scholarly views of this as not really a terribly great time for women, even though there were some changes, and the popular memory of Rosie the Riveter flexing her arm and saying we can do this and this idea that, you know, the war happened and women did everything and were liberated and isn't it great, which is a great story, but not at all true. <laughs> Um, but, you know, the, as you're saying, those, the sort of disjuncture between those two things um, has just kind of sat with us for many, many years. We haven't really tried to reconcile them. And so one of the things the book does is to try to say, how do we make sense of those two different views, which both have evidence to support them? How do we understand those? You know, and, and I think we've come down as editors and, and probably the authors as well, to think they can coexist, they do coexist, and it really depends on who you're talking about and what their particular experience of the war was, what kind of communities they were part of, what um, events happened to them, 
uh, you know, obviously a Japanese Canadian woman's experience of World War II is very different from someone who joined the, the women's armed forces and went overseas or, you know, it's just such a different set of experiences and communities that they were part of and, and things they couldn't, couldn't do. But uh, yeah, so, so thinking about emotions is, is a way to get at that personal level of experience and, and just explain to some extent how it can be, you know, the warriors can be a really wonderful, meaningful time for some women and girls and a really heartbreaking and hard and, and oppressive time for others, um, you know, that it is one event, but it's also an endless number of, of other events kind of under the same umbrella title. Um, and, and even within my own chapter and, and the different sources that I looked at, the different women uh, in the Red Cross Corps, you know, they had very widely divergent uh, views of what this service meant to them. And, and you know, even day to day, sometimes it was great one day and then you know, later that day or the next day, it was, it was really hard and, and they just wanted to go home uh, and have it all be over, which I think is how we all feel about the pandemic a lot of the times as well. So, Well, I was know, just going to say that, like, that is actually how we got talking about your book in our first conversation in the spring because you were saying you know now that the book is published and i'm looking at it again i'm realizing how both the pleasure and the pain of this moment can coexist at the same time and i yeah. thought yeah. i've thought about that a lot since we've spoken and i think it mm -hmm. is good and i even in speaking to teachers when um and their students coming to realize things like how do people still have children during the depression when it's yeah. the depression and you know like why would you bring this joy in when you know it's going to be very difficult and I think yeah. that that looking at this history allows us to be able to understand this moment but also this moment allows us to understand that history like it's this yeah. really nice yeah. way of going back and forth to understand who we are in this historical moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think one of the one of the things that also uh, attracts me to, to thinking about emotions in history um, and that personal level of experience is that it it is something that we all have experience of. You know, we might not get angry at the same things or, or feel anger in the same way or demonstrate you know happiness or, or fear or whatever, um, but we do have that personal connection and it's sort of an entry point into histories of big events, but also individual documents, um, which comes out in the one that we're going to look at in a little bit. But I also think it just thinking about emotions brings a different level of complexity and nuance to thinking about the past. You know, it's not just an endless series of events that happen, right? These are things that affect people deeply and, and in very personal ways. Um, and it just kind of, I don't know, I, I read a quotation uh, that sort of said history without emotions is like, like viewing in black and white. And when you bring the emotions into it, suddenly you just see the richness and, and complexity of what you're actually looking at, which is just kind of a nice way to frame mm -hmm. that. It's like uh, Dorothy opening the door. Yeah. 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 Um, one thing that I argue in my book, uh, which we, we weren't expecting to talk about, um, but it is also right there. And I'm very, it wasn't <laughs> out when, or it wasn't out when we spoke okay. before, is that I say that, that in history classrooms, primarily like middle school and high school, but it could work for undergrad as well, is that we need connection, complexity, and care. And often mm -hmm. teachers can bring in the connection, but that that can seem like an added stir. And so mm -hmm. it's the complexity of the stories that allows for more challenge to how we normally think mm -hmm. about the past. It allows for counter stories. And that's why things like naming emotional labor <laughs> is mm -hmm. such a revolutionary thing because it's easier than to recognize emotional labor in our own present. And so um, I love that you said complexity because it's something I've argued for quite a lot. Um, mm -hmm. And we are going to be able to look at that through the source that you have provided us. So I'm going to screen share it. Now, I can't do both um, pages at once, so we'll start with the bigger text right here. Um, can you tell us a little bit about this source? Absolutely. So this is a typewritten with a few handwritten editions um, letter, and the actual piece of paper, the artifact itself, is really interesting. So I'll say a few words about that, but it, it's a letter written by a woman who was in the Canadian Red Cross Corps during World War II. Her name is Mary MacDonald. 
uh, interesting sort of fun fact, she went on after the war uh, by the 60s to become the executive secretary for Prime Minister Lester B. Pearson. Um, and there's kind of a, a weirdly sexy birthday card from him to her <laughs> in her phone. That so just is you know, a fun fact. I know it's like Lester Pearson. You had a weird sense of humor, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so she's an interesting. Everyone lady. now she's is just like, oh, can we look at that <laughs> source right now? <laughs> I, know. I, know, I unfortunately do not have a picture of that, but uh, yes. Yeah, so this is sort of a useful, but probably early twenty-something um, Mary McDonald who went overseas with the Canadian Red Cross Corps. She's from Ottawa. Um, and she went overseas in 1943, so this is fairly early on in her, her time there. Um, she was there until the end of the war and a little bit after, so sort of late 1945. Um, and she worked as a, a, a welfare officer um, as part of the Canadian Red Cross Corps. So the Corps itself was um, created by the Red Cross during the Second World War uh, as a, a uniformed fairly highly trained and specialized body of women volunteers, so only women. Um, they wore a, a vaguely military style uniform. They did drill formations so that they would, you know, have this sort of team coordination, you know, take orders and whatever. And the idea was if Canada was attacked, there would be this group of, of women who were ready to do things like emergency feeding, setting up shelters, driving trucks and ambulances, doing um, the work of, of locating missing and wounded, kind of office-based office, office -based stuff, um, nursing assistance. Um, but that sort of disaster didn't materialize in Canada. So um, by, by about 1942, they thought, well, we do have a need for this kind of specialist um, voluntary labor in Britain, where the Canadian Red Cross had a major um, sort of launching site for its overseas relief operations with um, military personnel and civilians. So they shipped, uh, in the end, 641 um, Canadian members of the Corps went over to overseas. Uh, they served in, uh, essentially behind the lines uh, in Italy, in Northwestern Europe, a lot of them were in Britain. There were, I think, four or five in Newfoundland, which was a different country at the time. Um, and uh, and yeah, just sort of did whatever they were told to do, uh, but, but a lot of them ended up either driving ambulances and trucks or working as what they called welfare officers, which was sort of a generic caring role. Um, so some of them worked in, in canteens for servicemen, sort of, um, I don't know, fun centers where they would feed you, you could stay overnight, you could, you know, have paper to write letters, do little concerts, sort of this kind of a place to stay slash morale slash food. Um, some of them did drive ambulances back and forth. Uh, and uh, Mary McDonald and a, a small number of women were actually uh, followed the Allied advance into Europe, were posted with field hospitals that moved up behind the lines, and did the kind of work in hospitals that um, the nursing sisters usually didn't have time for. So um, non-medical stuff like passing out water and refreshments, um, writing letters home, adjusting pillows, just talking and listening was a big part of what they did, um, handing out cigarettes and other little comforts. Um, so it sounds a little bit, it sounds kind of light and fluffy, <laughs> but what's interesting and what I talk about in the chapter is, is the huge emotional toll that it took on women to do these kinds of supportive roles, because essentially they were recruited and sent overseas because of their practical specialist skills in one of these different areas. But when they got there, they found that really what they were needed for was to be women who cared about men. Um, in these, you know, very vulnerable situations of, you know, being sick and wounded in hospitals or far from home and, and just kind of disconnected from, from the men's um, normal lives. So uh, there is a sense that as women, they were kind of naturally fitted to be compassionate and caring and listen and supportive and morale boosting. But then their actual jobs in the Red Cross were to do those little almost intangible tasks that help people just keep their morale up. So you know, fluffing someone's pillow and adjusting their blankets and listening to them talk about their girlfriend at home is not going to save their life, but it may boost their emotional resilience enough to get through a hard day and go on to the next day and eventually recuperate. So that's what we talk about when, you know, we were talking about earlier about emotional labor. It's really the work of managing your own emotions and other people's emotions. And for these Red Cross women, it took a lot of emotional labor to manage their own emotions so that they could do their job of helping to manage men's emotions. Um, so there's kind of a, a double emotional labor going on there. 
And so just to get back to our, our, um, our document here, it's an air letter. So it's on this really thin blue paper um, that was both the envelope and the paper in one. So the other image, actually, you can see the address and the stamp and everything. But it was the idea that um, the military had this official air letter that you would write in a limited space as much as you could, fold it up, and it was very light. They could pack as many as possible into a single flight uh, back to Canada and, you know, it's sort of an official piece of correspondence uh, in that sense. Um, so Mary McDonald wrote, and I think there's more than a hundred of these in her uh, collection at Library and Archives Canada. And it's interesting, just as kind of a side note, that um, her mother, to whom this one is written, and her sister saved these letters that she sent during the war and after. They eventually found their way to Mary, who then saved them for many more years. And uh, when she passed on, they were donated to the National Archives. So at every step of the way, there's a sense that this is an important piece of history or document of her life, of the work that she was doing, of the larger Second World War. So even the fact that they survived um, says something about people at the time and since, how, how they valued this little, very personal account of, of one woman's war service. So just as an artifact, I find it, I find them really interesting. Um, and uh, this one is nicely typewritten, so, uh, so you can read it pretty clearly, but she complains in one of the other letters about the quality of British typewriters. <laughs> and she said they weren't what she was used to in Canada, and they were driving <laughs> her crazy. And I'm not sure what the difference was, but, but uh, I find that funny sometimes when you see she's crossed out uh, words and stuff with the typewriter. Um, well, and, and there's and a couple, like, there's a couple places like here where there isn't a space between two words and like you can right. see that she's like, yeah, you can see like, oh, no, that's not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, I mean, so it's interesting, everything that you were saying was really interesting about like the role of these women to, to basically like, like babysit grown men mm -hmm. in a way, like to be able to be the representation of like, mother and sister and girlfriend um, because you haven't talked about sexuality there but I think I think that goes without saying that there was definitely mm -hmm. that kind of element um, yeah they're sort of encouraged to be attractive and and lightly flirty nothing right. you know untoward but like yeah. a little light yeah. flirting is appropriate yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that like these women that uh, that that volunteered were probably I mean, it's it's not great to do these big kind of uh, assumptions, but the, one could make the assumption that a lot of the women volunteered in order to counter a traditional domestic feminine role, to be able to serve in a similar way that their brothers and their friends were. And so there must have been, for some women, this real internal conflict to be able to find that they were doing like an exaggerated version of womanhood there, but also recognize that that was part of mm -hmm. kind of what they signed up for. And so it's interesting mm -hmm. to think about that, uh, like that behind the scenes kind of push and pull that double emotional labor, like you said, mm -hmm. to be able to really uh, acknowledge the various types of work that women have done through military service. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, and I mean, the, the Red Cross Corps, one of the reasons that it fascinated me from very early on was that it's this weird kind of inter in-between thing between traditional women's volunteer work in wartime, which is on the home front, canning foods to be sent overseas, knitting socks, rolling bandages, like very explicitly domestic work on the one hand. And then in the Second World War, you have the option of women well, going into even more factories than they did uh, in the First mm -hmm. World War. But there's lots of that option. But but the the women's armed forces, you can now join the Army, Navy, or Air Force as a woman. And this Red Cross group is sort of in between that, in that they look a bit like women in the armed forces. They're doing military drill. They have you know orienteering skills, and and some of them before they were before they went overseas were trained in firing weapons just in case they found themselves in a situation where their mm -hmm. lives were in danger. Um, but they also have not made the choice to go the full step and join the armed forces, right? So it's sort of a, um, I feel like for some people it was kind of a safe advance mm. from the traditional that their mothers and grandmothers were doing, but not quite taking that final step. Although there were other women who joined this first and then when the armed forces were created, joined them instead, or moved back and forth depending where they thought would allow them to get overseas quicker. Mm. Um, 
So there is a woman, uh, at least one or two that I know that were in the Air Force and in the Red Cross, and they were hoping to join the Red Cross, but then the Air Force was created, so they joined that, and then it was taken forever, and they weren't getting anywhere, so they came back to the Red Cross and ended up going overseas with them first, and, you know, but, but the other point to what you're saying is that um, a lot of these women did view themselves quite explicitly after the war as veterans. They were never in the armed mm. forces and the Red Cross is explicitly a neutral humanitarian non-military group, but they considered themselves to be veterans of war service and, uh, and had a, a fairly lengthy campaign, which eventually was successful um, to get a, a limited amount of, of government benefits through Veterans Affairs. Um, which I find very telling. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So tell me as a historian that knows the Red Cross very well, that knows um, mm -hmm. uh, like World War II history fairly well, women in military conflicts in the 20th century, mm -hmm. what do you read from a source like this? And I, before I, <laughs> before you actually answer the question I posed to you, mm -hmm. I found it interesting when I'm reading this letter in relationship to some other conversations I've had with um, uh, with historians that have letters of soldiers and what one of the themes that we found when in through these conversations, which is why like having the conversations about the sources have been so wonderful, mm -hmm. is how much care um, how much care kind of goes back and forth in these letters like mm -hmm. men are writing to care for the people back home people back home are writing in ways that are like oh let's not talk about all the like blood and gore and decapitated bodies you saw like just so you know your kids are okay yeah. and what's interesting here is how so much of this letter is about like how is so and so and how is so and so and like here's my network my mm -hmm. social family network mm -hmm. of people that i'm still mm -hmm. interacting with and it's just a very it's it's just interesting those how care kind of manifests itself mm -hmm. to and from mm -hmm. families in these in these letters. I don't know mm -hmm. if that is something you want to pick up on. I just thought that was yeah. kind of an interesting theme. Yeah. What are things that you read through mm -hmm. these through uh, through this letter, for example? Yeah. Um, well, I chose it. It's very short. It's just the two sides. Sometimes they have extra pages, but this one's very short. I chose it specifically because I thought it was a good encapsulation of the theme of caring and of of social connection, I guess, really, that is a theme of the whole World War II women collection that we're talking about, and specifically of my chapter. Um, so I, I kind of talk in the chapter about the ways that these Red Cross women supported men and did emotional labor on duty, you know, their actual jobs and what they're doing, um, and their relationship with servicemen in that way. But then off duty is actually the bigger part of the chapter, because they're trying to maintain their own reserves of resilience to do that caring work that takes so much out of them. So they are, they are experiencing danger. Some of these women were torpedoed on the way to Italy, lost everything they had and just escaped their lives. They crossed the Atlantic to get there, you know, when the U-boats are patrolling and, and a lot of them are staying in Britain. They're, they're going through the bombings, the blitz, you know, all the, all the um, V-2 rockets and things. They're in overcrowded circumstances. They're on British rations or army rations. They're traveling behind the lines. They're hearing guns firing not that far away. They know the Germans could push back and, and overrun their hospital at any time. So there's all that kind of war context. Then on top of that, there's the people that I know back home in Canada and the ones that I know that are enlisted. Are they safe? Uh, mm -hmm. Are they aware that I'm safe? <laughs> there's that kind of mutual anxiety going on. Um, there's, you know, are we going to win the war? And, and then there's the daily grind of, of wow, I feel terribly exhausted and very personally upset and I now have to go into a ward and be cheerful and perky and make all of these guys feel like it's gonna be okay for the next two hours when they are lying there you know wounded or, or they're depressed or whatever so all of that kind of going on spills over into their off-duty hours of okay how do I having just gone through that kind of a work day how do I replenish my ability <laughs> to wake up in the morning and be caring or just even to do my job and try to be caring? Um, and so they do that through a variety of, of things. One is, you know, there's a lot of joking and laughter. There's a lot of kind of casual dating and social activities, especially if they're based in London and have access to, you know, the theater and movies and all this kind of stuff. Um, 
tons of social get togethers. They're constantly trying to contact people that they know, uh, friends, relatives, somebody's brother's neighbor's chiropractor, you know, if they're in Britain, they'll try and connect and, and, uh, and, you know, even just seeing somebody with a Canada flash on the shoulder is instant kind of connection. Um, and, and then on top of that, also trying to maintain their, their pre-existing connections with loved ones at home, which is the roundabout way of getting back to your initial point of, of what's in this letter and the kind of caring that comes out. So there's a lot in this letter about um, Mary either having seen or trying to see friends and relatives that her mother would know her brother was in the Air Force. So she's saying, you know, I know you wish I had already been able to see him. It hasn't been possible. You didn't have leave, but I'm really trying. We're going to be together at Christmas and, you know, sort of we're okay, basically, you know, and we will try and connect. But it's also very meaningful for her. And literally the first day she was in England, she went to the Royal Canadian Air Force our office to say, where's my brother? <laughs> um, so, you know, so it was a priority for her as well. Um, there's, there's some stuff in here about going out to her first English football game, i.e. soccer, uh, with, I think, sort of a, a friend from back home uh, that she had connected with. Um, you know, there's, there's comments on her sister has started violin lessons back in, in Ottawa and sort of Mary's thoughts on that, mutual friends, have you seen so-and-so, please remember me to this other person. Um, and, and so what I kind of came away with and, and try to talk about in the chapter is that these women in both overseas and in the ways that they, they connect with um, and correspond with people back home are trying to either create or recreate social networks of support. Um, and sometimes that's friendship, sometimes it's actual family ties, sometimes it's sort of imagined family ties. Uh, uh, one of the other uh, Red Cross ladies talks about having a, a brotherly relationship with a orderly at her hospital. She never had a brother and it really meant a lot to her that she had this kind of platonic brotherly relationship with this guy. Um, you know, best friends and, and making really close friendships with the people they were serving with, the other women, uh, sort of that shared shared horrors and shared intense experience, you know, creates these bonds. Um, and they're just, I, I just came away from all of these memoirs and letters and oral histories with a sort of mental picture of, of you know, someone starting at the edge of Canada and as they cross the Atlantic and, and head into Britain, these, these sort of webs just spinning out and, and interconnecting and I have a lovely anecdote about somebody who met up with someone that she knew to go out to dinner in London. And on the way there, they met up with either his or her cousin and that person's boyfriend. So then they all went to the museum and then they went to the dinner and met like a fourth person and they all ended up kind of spending the evening together. But it was just like drawing in anyone that they could to create these little bubbles of, of support and, and social connection and for me, I interpret all of that as being the ways that these people are, are finding to cope and to um, carry themselves through really trying emotional circumstances. So, you know, if, if the work and then even, even in their off hours when they're interacting with servicemen, they're also still unofficially doing that work of morale boosting and, and trying to keep their spirits out. I mean, these women were going, and nurses talk about this too, going out dancing all night when like the last thing they want to do is be on their feet. They're like, I do not want to dance under any circumstances, but golly, the boys have had a hard day. Let's go do it. You know, in the sense of like, it means so much to them. So we will put out that extra effort. So all of that is taking away from these women's uh, sort of um, own emotional reserves. So they have to fill that tank somewhere else. And they're doing it through creating these webs of connection, going out on casual dates, finding more time romances, going to the movies, laughing, joking, writing letters, getting parcels, all of this. And, you know, I think it was probably still a fairly uneven, you know, emotional balance, but you've got to keep something in the tank there to, to get you through. Well, and also like a lot of these people are quite young and, mm -hmm. and you know, that exuberance of youth <laughs> and having, having all of these young people together, like facing death constantly. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. whenever I'm scrolling through this letter, this mm -hmm. sentence always really strikes me. I am lucky, you know, and I don't know mm -hmm. if this isn't like, I am lucky. Like if this is a really uh, underlying mm -hmm. on purpose or if it was just a uh, coincidence, so. but yeah. it's, it's interesting because when I read the sentence, I am like, are you convincing yourself or are you convincing your mom? And mm -hmm. like, and like this notion of being lucky 
to have all of these social things are you trying to say like that's okay because of all of the horrors going through and like that's such an interesting way to mm -hmm. <clears throat> think about such a difficult experience mm -hmm. right like mm -hmm. i know you're yeah. worried i'm i can hear shells but i am lucky like mm -hmm. you should know all the people i'm talking to you should know this blanket i got you should know i got my muff cleaned mm -hmm. like i am mm -hmm. lucky the football game was good and yeah. i want reassuring others as much as yourself mm -hmm. yeah well i mean even even in the beginning of the letter she says early on you know thank you so much for the parcels the sweater and the socks whatever were great oh but i don't want you to think they're not taking care of me like I'm good. Right. So there's right off the bat, there is this kind of balancing act between I want to share with you these crazy and great and awful things that are happening to me so that we feel connected. But also I have to manage your emotions because you're my mother and I don't want you to freak out that I'm your 20 something daughter over in a war zone. Um, you know, and, and surrounded by so all these men. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, um, it's interesting in this on the other page, there's a similar Thing when she says, let me see if I can get a little bit closer here. Um, uh, gosh, where is it? It said, um, don't worry about me during the alerts. And so to me, that's like, okay, here's something war. Um, and then it says, I will be taken care of because I'm always in your prayers. <laughs> and mm -hmm. it's, it's like this push and pull, like, I know you're going to get these international things. Don't worry. Mm -hmm don't worry because I know you're worried and I know that you're mm. like thinking and like, you know, this, this yeah. back and forth. Yeah. Like, I know that one of, you're... This is one of the, yeah, you know, I was going to say, this is one of the challenges of any wartime correspondence is that we usually only have the side from overseas. Right. You know, Mary wasn't able to save the parcels and letters she was receiving, or they just didn't survive, you know, one of her moves overseas or something. So we don't know what her mom and her sister were writing. But probably, you know, I would imagine that is like, oh, you know, hey, so you mentioned that there are these air raid alerts in the night that you get up and you have to go down to the bomb shelter and like, I really worry about you. Like, are you okay? <laughs> right, is this yeah. safe? Should I be, you know, asking for you to come home? And she's like, oh, don't worry about me during the alert. You know, it's fine. It's yeah, fine. Yeah. Like, you're praying for me. It'll be great. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> but of course, we know there are a lot of people dying in, in Britain every night from air raids just like that. And there's yeah. no reason why Mary wouldn't be one of them. So, you know, again, getting back to your original question, I think it's it's such a wonderfully domestic letter, <laughs> this one that we're looking at, in that it's it's just full of small concerns and very personal, you know, like, so glad to get the khaki woolen sweaters, gloves, and ankle socks. Like, yeah. how much more personal <laughs> and small-scaled can you get than that? Mary's feet are warm now. Um, she's super excited because she got to choose a quilt for her new, you know, her new bed. Um, but it, but it is also written as an air letter on, you know, official Canadian military stationery yeah. from a war zone. And there's those little throwaway lines of like, you know, trying to get together with your brother in the Air Force over Christmas. He hasn't had any leave yet. You know, don't worry about me during the alerts. Um, and, you know, other letters have sort of similar, just these tantalizing little moments where you feel like Mary's, Mary's trying to address the elephant in the room, but also very wary of not alarming her loved ones and, and also probably not wanting to focus on it, right? That this the point of this letter is not to document the work she's doing that's draining her and the and the stressful circumstances. It's to connect with a totally different world and remind herself that she still has a family in a, a non bombed out country and that she can go back to that and she's still part of that world and they're part of her world. Mm -hmm. Um so yeah it's it's a, a a really interesting kind of emotional and, and practical dance that goes on in this kind of correspondence. And I think that if you <clears throat> are teaching this in your classrooms, especially in elementary and middle school, this pandemic moment can allow your students to think in different ways about, well, what are the types of things that you would write home? One of the people mm -hmm. I was speaking to uh, last week, and those videos are already up, um, the director of the Canadian Letters and Images Project, mm -hmm. which is... Great project. Action. I know, right? So I was <laughs> like, why haven't we spoken before? <laughs> and we looked at a letter from World War One, but it was a, a bit of an older man. He was 36. I laugh because I mean older in terms of... Um, <laughs> The regular World War One soldiers we think of, and yes. not because thirty six is old. Yeah, we're not um, old. <laughs> it's definitely not old. Um, and he just like wrote about like decapitated bodies and like boots full wow. of blood. And 
to that's think unusual. about. Pardon? <laughs> that's unusual. Yeah, it was, it was, and like, again, I, I mentioned earlier, his wife was like, okay, well, just come on home and your four-year-old daughter will be a good nurse to you, you know? Um, and so to like look at letters like that in relationship to each other, although obviously different wars, different circumstances, but like, what are the things that you would write home if you were overseas and you were serving your country in these different ways? Would it be like, oh, ask about so-and-so back home and this person and my mom is good and I like bicycling. Don't worry about the alerts. I am very lucky. Thanks for praying mm -hmm. for me. Or yeah. like, so I saved his belt buckle because we'll never know what he, who he was, you know? Yeah. Like, what are the yeah. things that you want your family at home to think about you if this is like your last day? That's mm -hmm. super mm -hmm. morbid, but that's what war is yeah. about, right? Well, I think also like yeah, on a given day, what will be the emotions or the experiences that you need to just get yes. out of you, you know, because yeah. a lot of people do use writing as a sort of self counseling processing kind of right. tool. So, you know, was Mary, Mary also was writing to a whole host of other people. Was she writing different things to different kinds of people? You know, her mother would get one thing and her best friend would get another, or, you know, mm -hmm. it would be interesting if we had all those to compare, but we don't. And I just wanted to, before I forget, I have a picture of Mary when she was a senior citizen. Yeah, uh, and it's kind of timely. So she's oh, look, she's 36 in that picture. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so this is Mary at the National War wow. Memorial in Ottawa. She went because she was from Ottawa. She would often lay the wreath um, as part of the official national ceremony for the Canadian Red Cross Corps. Um, again, because they had this sense of being a veteran. You can see her medals on her uh, her suit there and her little beret. That's her World War II Red Cross Corps beret that she wow. wore in the khaki and. And uh, yeah, so just an interesting lady. And obviously it was an experience that stayed with her, um, that she went back and, and was part of those ceremonies right into her older uh, years. That's great. Thank you for sharing that photo. It's so nice to like put a face. Put a face with, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just wanted to go back to your point about like, this is, this is what she sent her mother her she could have sent something else to her best friend and i think that's mm -hmm. like a really interesting point for us to remember like we're all different people with the different relationships in our right. lives and yeah. so what do you need to get out and who would be the safe mm -hmm. person to share that to and oh. uh it would be cool to like take that letter and be like okay now write a version to a best friend what yeah. would it be the same story yeah. Um, just as a way for us to conclude our talk, which has been amazing, why do you think sources like this are important to challenge how we normally teach about the past, World War II in particular? Um, I think for me, it, you know, there's, there's just the inherent interest of getting your hands on or looking at the actual evidence from the past and, and bringing to life people like Mary McDonald, you know, suddenly it's a real person. Um, but I think for me, in a larger sense, it comes back to what we were talking about, about those two opposite camps where scholars have one fairly negative view of what this war meant for women in Canada and popular memory is all Rosie the River keychains and, and let's, you know, we can do it. Um, that if we actually look at the sources, um, we have a chance to, on the one hand, weigh the evidence for ourselves, but also to see that it contradicts itself. Um, mm. Not all of Mary's letters are that cheerful. Some of them are, you know, she has her dark days. She's a very cheerful person, and yet even she has some dark days. Um, and and to see that you can feel multiple ways about the same mm. thing, that it can change over time, and looking at the actual primary sources just, I think, forces us, or hopefully forces us, as people who are very removed from those events, to step back and say, I don't necessarily know better than the people who lived through it. I have a different perspective and I might bring very valid, you know, objectivity to this question that they lacked, but I wasn't there. I didn't feel those emotions. I didn't have that experience. So I have to give some credence to the people who are actually telling me what it was like. Um, and, and to recognize that complexity to get back to what we we're saying and, and to recognize the nuances and the contradictions um, and when people tell us in their own voices and through their own artifacts what it was like and what it meant to them, that we do them the respect of believing them, right? We can add our own 
sort of surrounding interpretations, but that we preserve a space for them to tell us what it was like mm. uh, because they were there and we weren't. Yeah, that's so that's so wonderful. And so often women's voices in history, I mean, and in the present, get overshadowed or not, um, or just ignored. And how mm. much more valid it is when we do that with histories related to women specifically to ensure that we don't tell those voices what we want them to say. Mm -hmm. So thank you. What a wonderful and powerful way to end this conversation. And it's the three videos that I'm doing related to this book collection. I think it's such a kind of a really nice way to think about the collection in its entirety. Oh, thank so thank you again, Sarah. This was so wonderful. Yes. Always a pleasure to talk to you. Well, don't say that because last time you said that, I I was like, well, what let's do this. <laughs> so now if you just like get right on your next book, we can talk yeah. about it. <laughs> um, this was really fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, the link to the book is below. Your chapter uh, is in it, but you are co-editor of the collection. So um, your influence in these ideas are through every chapter, I'm sure. And so thank you again. My pleasure. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye. Bye.